Think about it every night, you know, what it's going to feel like when you win. And honestly, you, you can't write it up any better than the, what we just did there. No feeling is like what you think it's going to be. And this is the best feeling of my life. This is the best day of my life right here. And to share it with all those guys on the ice that are, that are my family, my brothers, I, I can't believe it right now. Just over five months have passed since the Coburg Cougars shocked the country and captured the national title. And we pick up right where we left off back then at the end of May. This is the OJ Today. Welcome to our very first show of the season, folks. Uh, launching in our fantastic new studio here. I'm Alex Bastjevansky. Each week we'll be bringing you all the action from the Ontario Junior Hockey League. The game highlights, the news, the player and team stories will be with you here all the way through to the end of the Buckland Cup in April and to kick things off this year let's get caught up on what happened last season and what's on the agenda for the 2017-18 campaign. The question is how do you top it? How do you top a 2016-17 season that was arguably the greatest in OJHL history? three different champions from the league. The Georgetown Raiders captured the Buckland Cup in an epic seven game series over the Trenton Golden Hawks. Trenton, two weeks later, got its revenge by beating the Raiders in the Dudley Hewitt Cup final, earning the right to advance to the Royal Bank Cup National Championship in Coburg. And at the RBC, the Cougars completed the OJ treble, downing the Brooks Bandits on home ice in overtime to win gold. It was the OJ's first national title in 10 years and it capped a magical season. Last year was one of the probably most successful years we've had in the league. Uh, we tried to do research and figure out if any leagues ever crowned three champions before in one year. We don't think it's ever been done, so we crowned a league champion with uh, Georgetown. Uh, then we have a provincial championship uh, with Trenton. And then it all accumulated, accumulated in uh, Coburg when Coburg won the national championship. So to be able to crown three champions in one year is kind of a special year that's never been done before. Uh, we got a few kids drafted in the National Hockey League again. Uh, and so it was exciting to have it all kind of come all together with um, the other night we were out and had the ring presentation with the Coburg Cougars. So um, it's interesting that we now have, you know, 66 kids that are champions within the league. We're normally only crowned the 23. So it was a fun year. It was great for the league exposure. Uh, we got a lot of coverage having the different champions, especially with the national championship as well so it all in all was a very successful year for us. As the league pivots into the 2017-18 campaign there will be no shortage of excitement and storylines. Parity seems to be the word that describes the league through the first two months of play. Top to bottom coaches and GMs are commenting that it's as competitive as they've ever seen it and the high-end talent continues to emerge. Vegas Golden Knights draft pick Nick Campoli returns to the North York Rangers this year and will no doubt be a force. And all eyes will be on the Toronto Junior Canadians as NHL scouts flock to games to survey the play of Jack McBain. The 17-year-old forward competed for Canada at this summer's Ivan Henlinka under-18 tournament and has been pegged as an early first-round selection for next summer's draft. Yeah, it's exciting to have a kid like Jack McBain come in and he could be a first-round pick. Uh, they're saying he could go as high as 10th. Um, you know, 
where he's going to slot in there. It's exciting for the league. What happens is it brings out scouts from all the NHL teams. They have to come have a watch. Um, he's an outstanding player. You just got to watch him. He's one of those kids you watch for two minutes and you understand what they see. He's big, strong, can skate, can handle the puck. He's had success at the international level already, um, and I'm sure he'll be a big piece of the pie going into the World Junior Championships for Team Canada East. So bringing those kids out and having a kid like Nick Campoli come back, who's already been drafted in the National Hockey League, to come back, I think it just speaks volumes of where the talent of the league is and the level of play within the league to have those types of kids playing within the OJ. Trenton has stepped up to host the Eastern Canada Cup, which will see Hockey Canada brass descend on the town as a roster is selected for Canada East for the upcoming World Junior A Challenge. So we're going to be hosting the Eastern Canada Cup with the 10 uh, different teams from five leagues coming in, which is a precursor going into the World Junior A Championships. Um, and uh, the kind of selection process follow that, so we'll be hosting. It's really exciting with that. Fans will notice an equipment change this year as the league has mandated that all players must wear full cages, eliminating the half visor citing safety as a main concern. We'll follow up with a feature story on the change on next week's show. With traditional powers such as Georgetown off to a fast start, resurgent clubs like Aurora, Newmarket, Wellington and the Toronto Patriots looking dominant thus far and NHL scouts making the trek to games to check out elite talent this season looks to continue the upward trend of the OJ as one of the top producers of junior talent. I think the one thing that it's proving is that uh, we are the league of choice. We have teams each year producing players and exposing these players to move them on to the next level. Uh, we just want to continue to build that year after year. Welcome back. Well, uh, how time flies. It's hard to believe that was over six months ago now. Uh, the Georgetown Raiders knocking off the Trenton Golden Hawks in a dramatic seven-game series to capture their first Buckland Cup in franchise history, while the Raiders had picked up right where they left off, leading the West Division and looking like they'll be a powerhouse once again. Well, Saturday night's game against Wellington may have been the most highly anticipated of any in the OJ so far this year. Uh, the Dukes have emerged as the runaway leaders in the Northeast Conference, so this contest was an opportunity for both squads to see how they stack up. This was the main event on Saturday evening, two of the OJ's top teams. The first period, uh, the story was Josh Capriotti, the Dukes keeper. First he stones Matt McJanet, and then soon after, Nicholas Prestia breaking in, victimized by the quick glove hand of Capriotti once again, though. He wasn't done. Jordan Crocker steals, feeds Connor McBroom, but no dice as he denies them once again. So it was scoreless at the break. A second frame, Georgetown does break the ice. Jaden Kandata, shot gets redirected home. Uh, Andrew Court complains to the official as uh, uh, D'Agostino got dropped, but Court gets the unsportsmanlike penalty. Ensuing Duke's power play, Mason Snell just acquired by Whitby the night before. He gets the one-timer to go, and it's 1-1. Four minutes later, Raiders, uh, they can't clear the puck here. Sloppy in their own end. Ben Evans taking full advantage. And Wellington up by a 2-1 count over the defending OJ champs. Not for long, though. 13-04 into the second. Jaden Kandata, again from the point, again deflected home, this time by Nicholas Prestia. That's his first as a Georgetown Raider, and they were all knotted up. It was 2-2. Two, two. Third period now, the Raiders pull ahead. Zach Dybowski with the howitzer from the point. The flex off a Wellington player ends up in the back of the net. Uh, Raiders back on top, leading 3-2. 12.09 mark now, Raiders with the man advantage. The money man, Jake Payette with the point shot. The flex off Rinaldi's stick. Dribbles in, if you're keeping track, all four Raiders goals tipped into the net. And they'll take it any way they can get it, though. That provides some insurance. Jason Smith adds an empty netter to make it a 5-2 Georgetown final. 
Well, last season's most lopsided first round playoff matchup was supposed to be the Northeast number one seeded Trenton Golden Hawks uh, taking on eighth seed Newmarket. Now, nobody, and I mean nobody outside of Newmarket, gave them a shot. So when the Canes jumped out to a 2 1 series lead by stealing both games in Trenton, uh, there were shock waves felt around the league. Now, the Hawks ultimately triumphed in six games, but it set the stage for this year. Newmarket entered the season brimming with confidence, and it shows they've been battling tooth and nail for top spot in the North Division. And last weekend, they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the squads they're chasing for first, the Aurora Tigers. The two teams that are significantly improved this season. Early on, it's Bradley Van Schubert with the larceny on Eric Aramita as he robs him on the breakaway there. Uh, the Canes just couldn't buy one. Adam Trotman dribbles it through Van Schubert, but he sits on it just in time. No goal. The Cats draw first blood. Tyler Davis cleaning up the garbage out front. And Aurora jumps out to the one nothing lead. Second frame now, Newmarket getting its chances. Two on one rush. Uh, Van Schubert shooting them down though. And it's still one zip. Then more from the Van Man. Eric Chella right on the doorstep. Bradley says, no way man. Huge stop. Back the other way they go. Aurora taking care of its chances. Luca Esposito out front, tips it in. And the Tigers have a bit of breathing room as they lead 2-0. Third frame now. And the Canes think they've cut the deficit to one on the power play. Van Schubert uh, way out of position on this one. Uh, and they say there's a reason why. Goaltender interference is the call. The Canes can't believe it. Plus a penalty, so no goal. Double whammy, but they do get that one back late. Uh, Ryan Hunt on the charge. Breaks his stick, but still manages to put it home. 2-1, but that's as close as they would get. Tigers add an empty netter to make it a 3-1 final as pink in the rink night is a good one for the Cats. They take the battle of Young Street 3-1. Okay, Whitby hosting Oakville last weekend. The Wildcats getting roughed up. Huge open ice hit by Jeff Clark on Liam Robinson there. Soon after, a Jacob Bush pulls the trigger. Top shelf, Oakville jumping out to the one nothing lead. A second frame now, Whitby getting it back. Shane Bull smashes it past Chris Elliott and it's even Steven. A 1-1 hockey game. Oakville will get one back to make it 2-1 though and then Zach Bramwell getting his first of the game to make it 3-1 Blades. Uh, the Wildcats get a bit of payback as Adam DeMaio tattoos Jack Ricketts with the wicked hit but then Bramwell nabs his second of the contest shorthanded no less. And the Blades are up by a comfy 4-1 count. Third frame now. Nate McDonald making the sweet save. Uh, trying to keep his boys in it. Good stop on Anthony Iguano. The Blades would notch one more eventually, though, to make it a 6-1 finale. Whitby struggling this year. Uh, just three wins in 17 games. Okay, Eastern Canada Cup is rapidly approaching November 13th to 15th, uh, where Canada East for the World Junior A Challenge will be chosen uh, TrentonGoldenOx.ca for ticket information and OJ trivia for this week. Who scored the winning goal for Coburg in the 2017 Royal Bank Cup Championship game? First correct answer to our Morocco at the OJHL.ca wins an OJ prize pack. Welcome back to the OJ Today. The Toronto Patriots raced out of the gate to start the season and they haven't looked back since the opening puck drop. Now, so far, they've notched wins over powerhouses such as Georgetown, Newmarket, and Oakville. And last weekend presented another opportunity to test themselves as they took on North Division leading Markham. A clash of two division leaders and it was all Markham early on. Bain Cunningham depositing the feed out front. Keeper Tyler Fassel saw nothing. One, nothing for the visitors. 11.08 in, Zach Sheedy to Braden Alban. Royals looking good early on. They were up two zip, but the Pats come back. Oliver Benwell and Andrew Petrucci playing a little give and go. Benwell hammers it home. 
and the Pats cut the deficit in half to 2-1. And then it's Lee Lapid giving it just a little bit extra, falling down, and it goes past Alex Bishop and the game all tied at two apiece. The crazy first period continues. Much more to come. Lapid redirects the point shot. 3-2 Toronto Pats. Back and forth they went. Markham on the charge. Bain Cunningham with his second of the game. And it's tied up again. Uh, now at three apiece. Still in the first, if you can believe it. Dante Spagnolo does this. And that is dirty. Might be the play of the week. 4-3 Patriots. Second period now. Toronto on the PP. And it's Mr. Spagnolo again. Uh, not as nice as the first one, but who cares? It's in. And it's 5-3. This game was insane. Non-stop. Royals 2-on-1. Jack Jeffers isn't going to miss that setup. Nice play. Uh, it's 5-4. Surprise, surprise. They do tie it. Nick Gianta out front. Spins. Puts it past Fassel. A defensive gem this wasn't, but it was entertaining. 5-5 five, five at the break. Third period. Pats get the winner. Spagnolo, Don't blink. Vicious. Rister. That's the Hattie for Dante. Six points total on the night. Toronto would add two more to make it an 8-5 final. The fans definitely getting their money's worth as Markham loses for the first time in seven games. Well, it's been a bit tough to get a read on the Kingston Voyagers so far this year. Now, currently they sit third in the East, uh, just a game over 500, but the V's have posted some big wins. Georgetown, Oakville, and Aurora are just some of the top squads Kingston has bested. Now, Saturday, they were looking to grab two points against the Stouffville Spirit. And the Spirit, another team struggling early as they've won just six times in 19 games, but they draw first blood. 4-17 in, Brandon McKinnon bulges the twine, and Stouffville jumps out to the 1-0 early lead. All Vs from that point on, though. Seven minutes later, Austin Grisania with the awesome solo effort. Nathan Torchia probably should have had that one, too. And it's 1-1. Late in the frame, Grisania getting his second. Uh, right place at the right time in front of the net as the point shot will deflect in off his body. K-Town going up by a 2-1 to one count. Second period, they would add to that lead. Cole Edwards calling forward out front. Uh, gets it and makes the most of it. Kingston with a bit of a cushion now up 3-1. Uh, third frame, they would put it completely out of reach. Edwards feeds Danny Rydell, who somehow gets it to go past Torchia. Not pretty, but it works. 4-1 for the boys from the Limestone City. And uh, they would make it five. Shorthanded, Dorian Overland showing off the soft hands. Shelves it past the keeper. 5-1 Kingston as they win this one going away. I'm telling you, keep an eye on the Vs. Their record uh, thus far isn't really indicative of their strength. This is a squad that's going to turn some heads this season. Okay, the struggling spirit visiting Markham. And the Royals pounce early and often. 157 in Zach Sheedy. A beauty over the shoulder of Nathan Torchia. Uh, it is nice, but take another look as it's bad luck for Stovall. It deflects off the stick of D-man Jordan Jackman. Two minutes later, Brett Odekirk feeds El Capitan Lucas Condada. And the quick shot catches Torchia by surprise. And the Royals lead by a 2-0 count. Uh, the Spirits come close to getting one back. Brennan Young on the break. Interfered with, penalty called, but no penalty shot. Ensuing power play. They come oh so close, watches the puck, will sneak past Cole Brady, but just not quite over the line. Great uh, camera work by Joe Montezano there. Second period, the Royals start to run away with it. Torchia can only do so much here. Makes a couple of big saves. Nobody watches Nick Janta. He says, I'll take it. 3 nothing. Markham at that point. And then Jack Jeffers goes to work. He might have the softest hands in the league, this guy. Strips Justin Mahaber. Goes Roof Daddy. Beautiful. Four zip. Royals. Uh, the Spirit would snap the shutout, though. And it's a great solo effort by Costa Manikis. Over the shoulder of Cole Brady. And it's... 4-1. to one. That seemed to give them a pulse. Third period now. Stouffville. Power play. Connor Evans, the howitzer from the point. 
Spirit cut the deficit in half. Uh, it's four to two. They nearly pull within one as Wesley Weir off to the races here, but Cole Brady, save of the game, uh, gets the pad down to deny on the break there. They do get it within one. Uh, the question is, how much exactly is Brady expected to do here? I don't know. Count the saves the man has to make here. Uh, right up front of the net. One, two, three. No help from his defense. Andrew Hughes cleans up the garbage and the spirit now only trail. 4-3, but late in the period, the Royals put this baby to bed. Sam Merritt turns on the Jets, breaks a few ankles in the process, tickles the twine, solo effort, nice. And that was it, the Royals. Uh, red hot right now. They've lost just once in their last eight games and are battling for top spot in the North Division uh, with both Aurora and Newmarket. Welcome back to the OJ Today. All eyes will be on the Toronto Junior Canadians this year as NHL scouts will be flocking to their games. Now the reason Jack McBain, the 17-year-old Dynamo, played on Canada's under-18 squad in August and has been pegged as a likely first-round selection for next June's NHL draft. But the JRCs are much more than just Mr. McBain. They sport a balanced lineup with skill up and down the roster. That skill was on full display against the Patriots last weekend. I'm a fan of a good old fashioned hip check. You don't see them as often these days. Jeremy Smith is making it his mission to bring it back. As he lays out Ryan Wells with a beauty along the boards. Soon after, it's Smith uh, laying it off for Jake Joffe. Joffe breaks in, beats Tyler Fassel. JRC's up by a one nothing count. Second frame. Uh, Dalton Ewing with one of the stops of the year so far on Lee Lapid. I am cringing just watching this. That is some serious stretching right there and the puck stays out. Remember Smith and his hip checks. There it is again, this time on Oliver Benwell as he crushes the Patriot. Now Jake Joffe and Jack McBain may be the best one-two punch in the league this year. Here's the evidence, McBain to Joffe. And uh, his second of the game, JRC's lead by two. You can't keep the pads down for long, though. The home run pass for Oliver Benwell, who feeds Lee Lapid, one-timer, and the deficit is cut to 2-1. But the JRC's take control in the third frame. Jason Paneo just throws it at the net here, and somehow it finds its way past Dalton Ewing. And it goes, take another look here, bit of a knuckler that fools the keeper and the Canadians are back up by a two spot. Then they close it out with an empty netter. Matthew Redding uh, makes no mistake about it. So a big win for the JRCs, make no mistake, as they take it 4-1. Patriots were rolling on an eight game winning streak and that snaps it. Okay, one more for you. The West leading Raiders traveling to St. Mike's. Pick it up in the first. Uh, G-Town already leading one nothing. Matt McJanet, Jumps all over the juicy rebound to put the visitors up by two goals. Only Matt's second goal of the season, but he would add to that total further in the game. Second period now. The Raiders continue to press. Jason Smith um, will take the shot. Jordan Crocker goes hard to the net and just gets a stick on it. Well done. They've been a good combo, those two, this year. Georgetown up 3 nothing, And then on the power play, 849 in. New pickup, Zach Elson feeds the big man, Jake Payette, and boom. All six foot seven behind that blast. Georgetown comfortably up for nothing. It's almost five, but uh, Cosimo Lazzarino doing what he could for St. Mike's. Matt McJanet right there, denied by the double blue goalie, though. Nice save. And the Raiders get into some penalty trouble, and St. Mike's pounces Cameron Searles uh, back to Mike Pellegrini. He rings it off, the goalie's best friend, though, and the puck stays out. But shortly after, uh, St. Mike's will hit the score sheet. Searles blows the chance with the open net, but then gets it back and will feed it to Dylan Jackson and the buzzers on the board. They trail 
4-1. Then eight minutes later, another power play. Searles setting up shop by the side of the net. He doesn't miss uh, this one, as you will see. And in it goes. St. Mike's uh, right back in it. They cut the deficit in half. It's 4-2. Just before the intermission, though, the Raiders stretch their lead again. Andrew Court with the sweet pass from behind the net here for Brendan D'Agostino. One-timer, and that made it 5-2 for G-Town. The Raiders would add one more in the third to make it a 6-2 final. G-Town picking up where they left off last year, currently with a comfy nine-point lead in the West. OG standings. Let's take a look. North Division, Markham in a battle with Aurora and Newmarket there. 22 points, 21 and 21. In the East, the Dukes, great young team. Look at the bulge over Trenton there. 14 points between Wellington and the Golden Ox in second. In the South, the Pats uh, narrowly ahead of Oakville, followed by the JRC's North York, Mississauga and St. Mike's. And in the West, Georgetown, as mentioned, a comfortable nine point lead over Orangeville, followed by uh, Burlington, Buffalo, and Milton. The Chaos Top 5, brought to you by Chaos Hats, the official hat provider of the OJHL. Number 5 Junior right. Canadians D-man, Jeremy back, Smith. Sir, right here, it's that's back, using your hip. Well. Absolutely oh, lays out Ryan Wells, Ryan Wells with the Wells beauty the hip check the along right. the boards. Smith. Number 4, Markham's Jack Jeffers, so quick, so smooth. Roof Daddy against Stouffville, part of a 5-3 Royals win. And number three, same game, Costa Manikis of Stouffville with the fantastic solo effort here. Blocks the shot, goes for a skate, and beats the keeper over the shoulder. Sweet. Number two, JRC's goalie, Adult Ewing, making like Gumby to deny Lee Lapid of the Patriots. My voice is going up an octave or two just watching that save. Unreal. Number one, Dante Spagnolo had six points against Markham, including a hat trick. This was the nicest of all. Victimizes uh, D-man Brendan Bastassin and then hammers it home. Take another look. 28 points in just 19 games for Dante this year. And he's got our vote for the chaos play of the week. And we've got to run all out of time for this week, but to keep up to date with uh, everything in the league, all your news, stats, scores, and standings, uh, make sure you head to ojhl.ca and you can check out all the other social media outlets as well. Thank you so much for watching, folks. We'll see you next week.